this morning. You may be seated. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews. We continue working our way through this great book, verse by verse. We're in Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to read verses 19 through 25. We're coming to kind of a transition in the book of Hebrews today, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. But first, we want to read it. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19, reading through verse 25. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he constructed for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Let's bow for prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Guide us as we study today to understand these important points, to see how we should respond to these great truths that we've been taught. Lord, help us have ears that hear, hearts that receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so you see, what we've been looking at in the book of Hebrews so far has been basically all theology. It's been theological stuff. It's been heavy-duty doctrine. But now, as I said, we're in a transition, so we're going to get into some practical stuff. In other words, the application stuff, the here's what you do with the teaching that I've been giving you stuff. I mean, we've had argument after argument after argument for the superiority of Christ. We've been told that Jesus is better. We've been told that over and over. He's better than the old covenant, better than this, better than that, better than everything. And so now we get to this passage and it's almost like we're summarizing the truths and being told how to live with it. So what we're seeing, first of all, is a recap, a recap of what we've been looking at or kind of a conclusion, if you will, so that we will be led to the point of asking that all-important question, how does this apply to my life? How am I supposed to respond? And then... Then we're going to be given three ways that we can respond as believers. Three ways, and each of them will begin with the words, let us. There's one in each of the verses, verse 22, verse 23, and verse 24. Now, some people affectionately call this the salad section of Scripture because it's filled with so much let us. I think they think that's a joke. I fell flat on my face in Sunday school. Nobody laughed, and so I'm not e expecting anything from you people this morning. But this is the salad section, they say. But it's important. It really is important. We've been given large quantities of knowledge and all kinds of good arguments for why Jesus is better, but lots of knowledge really doesn't do us any good. Not unless we apply that knowledge to our lives. And so what we're doing is we're given practical ways that we can apply it, that we can apply this knowledge. And by the way, isn't that typically Pauline? Now, we don't know whether Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. It's really an anonymous book. But Paul typically would write his epistles this way. He would give us the first half as doctrine. The second half would be application. You can go through any of his epistles, and that's basically the way it works. And that's the way the book of Hebrews is written. Hebrews is divided into a doctrinal and a practical section. We're now headed into that practical section. So we get application, how it applies to our lives. But first, the author's got to restate the main, doctrinal, the main doctrinal truths all over again. And so verse 19 says, Hebrews 10, 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Christ, by the blood of Jesus. Remember that? We've been covering this many times. The greatest advantage of turning to Christ is that we get access to God. We can come before God. We have boldness to enter his very abode, the holiest. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about how that wasn't the way in Judaism. Access was blocked for the Jew. 
And now, though, we are encouraged to come and to enter with boldness. Now, boldness doesn't mean brashness. It doesn't mean with disrespect. I mean, God certainly, he deserves our reverence and our respect as we enter into his presence. We should never be flippant or disrespectful. But what this word has the idea of is freedom of speech. We can come before God and we can say whatever is on our heart and mind. It's like it said back in Hebrews 4.16, there was the invitation, let us come Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. We can come before God any time. We can express ourselves before God with no reservations. We can freely enter into God's presence whenever we like and we can tell him anything on our hearts. We can bear our hearts and our souls before God. We can pour our heart out to God any time we feel the need and we will know that God, he will be there. He will be listening to us. He will be gracious to us as a parent is to their children since he is our heavenly father, right? And just why can we come so freely? I mean, what gives us this access? Verse 19 says, it's because of the blood of Jesus. Now the high priest Back in the Old Testament, the high priest could enter the holiest of holies only once a year and then only with the blood of the sacrifice. We, on the other hand, we can enter God's presence anytime we like, but only on the basis of the blood of Christ. Now that means only because his blood was shed as payment for our sins once for all time. That's how we gain access. We can never get in based on our own character or our own works or on the denominations that we're part of or even on our profession of faith. None of that gets us access to God because any of those things can be, who knows, they can just be made up almost. Like Matthew 7, 21-23, Jesus said that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God. That's a profession of faith. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? So all these great, wonderful works we've done. And then Jesus said, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There's no way we can make it to heaven based on anything except the blood of Christ. Our access, it has nothing to do with us. It's kind of like, remember the story of the prodigal son? prodigal son that left home and spent all of his inheritance in profligate living and then there in the pig pen eating the husk with the pigs he decided he would go home and throw himself on the mercy of his father. So he came home in desperation. He came totally helpless to his house. He had nothing to offer within himself that would merit his father's love but it was love of the father did everything that was necessary for his return. Like it says in Luke 15, verse 22 through 24, it says, But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and let's be merry. For this my son was dead. Like we were spiritually dead. And now he's alive again. We've been born again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry all based on the Father's love. And friends, God is that overjoyed when we seek him. And he welcomes us with that same joy when we come to him. And he provided the access through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. That's why we're invited. And as a matter of fact, that's why we're encouraged to come before him. God wants us to come. He takes joy in our fellowship. And so what should we do? We should take advantage of it. What else do we know about the new covenant? Verse 20, Hebrews 10, verse 20. It's by a new and living way which he, which Jesus consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Well, first of all, notice it's new. Now, the word new, it's got the idea of fresh, but at the beginning, the word literally meant a freshly slaughtered sacrifice. But it over time, took on the meaning of recent. 
Now, you've got to remember, the Levitical priests offered up the same sacrifice year after year. By the hundreds of thousands every year, I mean, same old, same old, year after year, the, the animals were brought in, they were checked, they were slaughtered, they were burnt. It was old and stale and, quite frankly, probably rather boring after a while, but Jesus' sacrifice is different. It is new and it's different because by it we can now have boldness. No, no Old Testament worshiper an Old Testament worshiper did not dare to have boldness like that because they would be killed if they tried to enter the, the temple where God's presence was. But the new covenant notice is also living, it says in verse 20. It's living. Well, why is that? It's because Jesus is alive. The lambs, they died, they stayed dead. But Jesus, yeah, he was crucified. Oh, yes, he was, but he rose again the third day because God accepted his once-for-all sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 15, in that passage that defines the gospel, says this, verse 4. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So Jesus is alive. When we come to God through Jesus, we come by a living way, and Jesus is that way. He said himself, John 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father. Notice how exclusive it is. Except through me, he said. Now, the lambs that were sacrificed, they stayed dead. Jesus, on the other hand, he conquered death. And he did it so we too could have eternal life. And the result was that a way for us to get to God was open in verse 20. It says it was through the veil that is his flesh. Now, remember the story? Back in the temple, there was this great, big, thick veil. Terribly thick. It was a veil in the temple that separated the holiest place from the holiest of holies where God's glory dwelt. No one but the high priest, of course, could enter beyond the veil and that only with the blood of the sacrifice. But when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. No man could have done that. But God did to show us the way was made to God himself. In Matthew 27, verse 50 and 51, we read it. It says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he, he yielded up his spirit. And then, behold, the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. That was symbolic. It was symbolic of Jesus' flesh, which was torn by the scourge and on the cross of Calvary, all to give us this access to God. And so our access, it's no longer blocked, not from God. I mean, praise God, hallelujah, we can go anytime we want into his very presence. But how are, we to, how are we supposed to respond to this great truth? You wonder that? I mean, it's truth, but how do we respond to it? Well, the author, he is giving us three ways, and each way, as I said, begins with the word, let us. First is verse 22. Hebrews 10, 22, it says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Again, notice this is an invitation. We are given a special invitation to come into God's very presence. But as a Christian, that seems strange because aren't we already in the presence of God? I mean, after all, aren't we all indwelt with the very Spirit of God? I mean, the Scriptures are clear on that. We are. Romans 8, verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. So if you're not indwelt with the Spirit, you're not even a Christian. But if you are, if you are born again, God has implanted his Spirit inside of you. So you're always in the presence of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says the same thing. It says, do you not know that you, your bodies, you personally, you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells where? In you. In you. Every believer is indwelt. And Paul gives his personal testimony in Galatians 2 verse 20 where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I live. But what? Christ lives in me. And the life in which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
If you're born again, you need to revel in that same truth. God dwells in you. His spirit has been implanted in you. And so, if we're always in the presence of God, why do we need this invitation? The answer is quite simple. It's because we don't, we don't always live as if we know this. We don't always live as if we know it. Most Christians live like practical atheists. It doesn't mean they're atheists, but that means they live like atheists. They live life as though God doesn't exist in their daily lives, it, at least not in how they, they live it or how it affects them in their daily lives. And so what we need to do is we need to start living in the awareness that we are always, always in the presence of God. And since we are always in the presence of God, we need to remain in fellowship with him. Brother Lawrence, he used to call this the practice of the presence of God. And that's what we need to do. We need to practice being in his presence. We need to do that. We need to spend time with God daily through our prayer, through our Bible reading, through our meditation. Spend time with him daily. Stay in his presence throughout the day. Stay moment by moment by moment in fellowship with him. And I'm not talking about just visiting him once a year like the high priest did or, you know, like the some people, they call them the Christmas and Easter Christians. They come out once or twice a year and that's it. Not like that at all. Or, or even don't be like those who are once a week Christians. They profess to be a Christian. They come to church and they forget him from Monday till Saturday night when they start thinking about Sunday morning. I mean, can you imagine being satisfied with that? Spending your life without any fellowship with God? And yet, isn't that the norm for so many Christians? It really is interesting. I, I wonder, on Sunday morning, for those who only come sporadically, do they wake up Sunday morning and start scratching their head and say, do I go to church today or not? I mean, how do they make that decision? What do they base it on? Whether there's something better going on that day or not? I don't really know. But we need to be practicing the presence of God. We need to go to him with a true heart, it says in verse 22. With a true heart, a heart that desires God more than anything. He is the one that we love the most, isn't he? I mean, shouldn't we want to be with him in his presence moment by moment? You know, when a young man falls in love with this beautiful young lady, he wants to spend every waking moment with her. And even more than that, usually. But why don't we want to spend time with God like that? We love him most of all. You know, it says a true heart. What is a true heart? A true heart is a heart that comes before God with no hypocrisy, with no ulterior motives. It, it wants no more than to worship and fellowship with God. It's not reserving love only if God does what we want. You know, so many people, they act like God is this genie in a bottle that is required to grant us our three witches. Or like Santa Claus, you send him your Christmas list and he's obligated to bring you what you want. And if he does, hey, God's okay in my book. But if he doesn't, well, that's not what God is about. We love him because of who he is. We want to spend time with him because of who he is. How many believers have this kind of a conditional love for God. I don't know. They go, oh, sure, I'll love you, God, if, you know, if he gives me an easy life, if he provides for me all my needs and my wants, if he, if he never lets any bad thing happen to me, then I'll love him. That's not a true heart. That's not a true heart at all. But if we come with a true heart, God has promised us many things. Look at Deuteronomy 4, verse 29. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 4, verse 20. And it says, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will what? You will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. That's a guarantee. You want to spend time with God? He'll be there to spend time with you. Guaranteed if you seek him with your heart, a true heart. And to that true heart, we are to add faith. Hebrews 10, verse 22 says, In full assurance of faith. And we need to understand that faith in Scripture is really an action word. It's not something you feel. You act on it. I mean, if you really believe something, you act on that belief, don't you? If you believe that some medicine works, you'll take it. If you don't, you probably will skip taking it, even though the doctor recommended it. You know, if you believe something, you act on that belief. The belief will literally change you. 
what's interesting is that so many believers are like demons in their faith. I want us to look at James chapter 2, looking at verses 19 through 20, and this is a passage that talks about worthless faith. This is what it says, James 2, verse 19. You believe that there is one God, you do well. <laughs> Even the demons believe, and they tremble. So, you know, you believe in one God, you're no different than the demons at this point. But, verse 20, do you want to know, foolish men, that faith without works is dead? In other words, faith that does not accomplish anything or change anything, it's worthless. I mean, do you see this? Yeah, the demons believe. They believe so much that they tremble in fear before the Lord. But they still hate God, and they still live in rebellion against him. But, oh, they believe. They believe for sure. But only true faith, it causes us to desire God, to want God, to love him, to want to be in his presence, not to live life as though we were living somewhere apart from him. And so we must come to him in faith with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Ah, but let's continue with verse 22, the rest of it. Preparation is required to come before God. Hebrews 10, verse 22, it says, Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Well, that lets us understand that, you know, can anybody come before God? The answer is no. You cannot come unless you are clean, unless you're clean. I mean, you certainly wouldn't go to an appointment with the king or uh, the president of the United States or something without first taking a bath and putting on clean clothes, right? So neither should you do that before God. You would not come before God while you were still dirty and defiled by sin because he wouldn't accept you then. What this is doing is it's looking back to the, the ceremonial cleansing of the priests where they would continually wash their bodies and all their vessels in this prescribed manner. And it was also they would be ceremonially clean before God. But their cleansing, it was required before they could go into his presence or they could not go. But in the church, aren't we all priests? Seriously? I mean, they were priests because they were Levites, but we're priests because we're Christians. First Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a what? A royal priesthood. You are a priest before God. So therefore, shouldn't we also be clean before we come before God? Of course. And how do we do that? Well, not through our ceremonial washings in a bowl of water. We do it through confession. 1 John 1, 9, I quote this to you all the time at communion service, right? It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and the word, and to cleanse us, wash away all that filled, all that sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, the Jews, they clean the outside of the body, but our confession, it cleans the heart. And that's where the Spirit of God dwells. And we want that to be clean for him. I mean, do you see this? This isn't talking about having a clean body, but about having a clean heart. And that is what is necessary for real fellowship with God. A clean heart. So do you want to enter God's presence? You have to come with a clean heart. With a heart that is true and a heart full, full of assurance for faith. But if you do... You have full, unhindered access to God at any time. Now here, that's the first and foremost blessing for us to avail ourselves to. We're invited into God's very presence at any time. And we come not as an intruder, but as an invited guest. So any time we come before God's throne, we come not as a slave, but as a son, as a child of God. And we can fellowship with him there. That leads us to the second let us in this salad section of scripture. Hebrews 10 verse 23, it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So hold fast, that's what we're supposed to do and we're supposed to do it without wavering. But hold fast to what? Hold fast to what? The answer is we hold fast to the confession of our hope. Why? Why should we hold fast? Well, it's because Jesus is holding fast to us. He's the one who made the promise that we cling to, and he is completely faithful. 
If you look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24, it says that he who calls you, he is faithful who also will do it. He's not going to let you down. You can trust him. And you know he's going to come through for you. He is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. He is your daddy that you can snuggle up with and rest your head on his shoulders. He is your Abba, your father. So why wouldn't you cling to him? Why? Now that, fa- that phrase, hold fast, it's got the meaning of to be the master of or to be in command of. And what you're to be in command of is your faith. You control it so you don't let it waver. Don't let circumstances cause you to give it up. But specifically, this verse says we are to hold fast to our confession of hope. Well, what's your confession? (laughs) Your confession is what you say about it. In other words, this is what you tell people. But you know, so often when things get tough, sometimes we change our message. Sometimes, you know, we try to hide what we think so that we'll be more acceptable to our audience. You don't really believe that stuff about Jesus, do you? They ask, and so you say, well, well. They say, you don't really believe he rose from the dead? I mean, how could you? That doesn't happen. And you, you say, um, uh, you can't be serious. You think Jesus is the only way to heaven? How narrow-minded and bigoted. And you go, oh, my. Uh. See, our tendency under these kind of pressures is to, to let our confession slip Well, you know, I'm not trying to push my faith on anybody. I mean, you can believe whatever you want, we say. Or even worse, we say, no, you know, I like the way Jesus taught on morality, but nobody really believes all those miracles and things. You see, your your confession, it becomes no different than anybody else's in the world. And you've let it happen. Some people, so they go so far as to completely give up their faith and their hope altogether. But a person who genuinely trusts Christ, they cannot help but be filled with hope. And that's even in the worst of conditions. See, a hopeless believer, it's a contradiction in terms. You cannot be a believer and be hopeless. It can't happen. So Jesus, he died for our sins to redeem us, right? Hallelujah. And we're freed from the penalty of sins. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so we can have hope in that. We can trust it. We have promises like Hebrews 13, verse 5, where Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Or like John 10, verses 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. I and my Father are one. What a promise that is. Or John 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Or John 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who were in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, 
nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whew, I'm getting tired of reading. We could go on and on and on with promises. But why would anybody ever let go of those promises? Why would we ever give up our hope? Why would we ever give up our profession of faith? And yet, that's exactly what so many Jewish believers in the audience of the book of Hebrews, they were in danger of doing. And that's precisely why the author of this book is urging them, don't look back. Don't go back to Judaism because your Messiah has come and he's so much better. There he is. He's Jesus, the fulfillment of all that Judaism pointed to. So now, now you must cling to him. And instead of looking back, we ought to be looking ahead. Don't look back anymore. Look forward. Look forward. Look for the second coming of Christ when all the end time prophecies will be fulfilled. If you look ahead, you will see him face to face someday. So hold fast. That's not our way to salvation, of course not. But it certainly is evidence that we are saved if we do. A person with genuine faith, he will hold fast to that hope. Now finally, the third let us is found in verse 24. Verse 24. It says, And let us consider one another our brothers and sisters in Christ, in order to stir up love and good works. This verse is pointing to our responsibility to each other. The word consider, it means be attentive to, pay attention to the needs that they have. It means that we are to know what's going on around us in the life of other believers, which means we need to be a part of one another. Oh, it's not talking about being snoops. We're not supposed to snoop. We have not been appointed the town snoopervisor here, okay? Nor are we out getting ammunition to gossip about with one another. But we are being attentive so we can help one another. We use the attention of our fellow believers, it says, in order to stir up love and good works. That's what we're supposed to do, to stir up love and good works with each other. I like the way the old King James Version translates it. It says we are to provoke one another. What does that mean? Provoke means to excite them. To excite them. We're to excite one another to serve Christ. And isn't it true? I mean, man, this Christianity, this is exciting stuff. I mean, not only does it provide a way for us to, to get out of our sin predicament and our eternity in hell. I mean, you get this pass out of hell, right? What a great thing that is. But it gives us the greatest and the most fulfilling job in the whole universe. Because we get to be part of the body of Christ. We get to be Christ's arms and his legs and his hands and his vocal cords. The, you're the vocal cords of Jesus. And so what do we do? Well, we get to go and give hugs for Jesus to those who need them. We get to give support to those who have needs. We get to give encouragement and exhortation to one another. And we, of course, we carry the gospel message on our lips. And that, of course, is the power of God unto salvation. So we literally bring salvation to the lost. That's us. We're servants of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a fantastic job? But it's not just ours. Do you see this? We are supposed to cause other people, other people to love and do good works too. Literally, we're supposed to stir them up. So we are supposed to do that for one another, to excite them, to provoke them to love and good works. I do hope my sermons agitate you and excite you to love one another. And I hope my sermons motivate you to do good works. I mean, that is exactly why I preach. I'm not up here to just spout words. I'm doing it for a purpose, to excite you and to agitate you to love and good works. If I preach, I just might be able to do that, maybe. But how can you do that? How can you do that for other people? I mean, you don't have the same access to this pulpit as I do, right? So how can you stir up others to love and good works? Ah, I'm glad you asked because the answer is in the very next verse, verse 25, where it says, Hebrews 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, you know, those people out there who never go to church, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. See this? 
we stir each other up to love and, and good works through our fellowship in the church. See, you didn't come just to worship God. That's not it at all. You came to exhort each other. Now, did you notice the emphasis of this verse isn't on what you get from attending the services of our church, but it's on what you give to others by attending the services of this church. It's about what you contribute. You know, people often say, you know, man, I just don't get anything out of going to church. Man, it's just not worth it to me. You know, or they say things like, hey, I can worship just as well down at the old fishing hole. And you know what? They might be right. It might be easy to worship down at the old fishing hole. But let me ask you a question. Can you encourage anybody else down at the old fishing hole? Maybe if you took them along fishing with you, but chances are probably not, right? But you can encourage people when you come and attend church. <laughs> I mean, don't you miss it when other people are gone? I mean, look around and say, where's so-and-so? I miss him today. I would, I would like to have seen him. Now, when you're gone, we miss you the same way. We really, really do. We miss you. And that's because each of you are an important part of this fellowship. And you can participate in the time of testimonies we have, like in the evening services, and the time in the back foyer or in here. You could talk to each other and encourage them before or after the services. You know, and hopefully you're talking about more than just the weather. But you see... God knows that the best way for you to stay in fellowship with him is to stay in fellowship with other believers. That means you need to attend church. Now, in our spiritual lives, we're like charcoal. You know, one piece of charcoal, if you, you got a whole bunch of them burning together, burns good, you take one piece, set it off by itself, it's going to go out real quick. That's your spiritual life separated from other believers. But when all the charcoal are piled up together, they burn hot. That's a lesson for us, isn't it? The lesson is we need each other. We really, really, really need each other. We are critical to the spiritual life of one another. It's necessary that you are in attendance of the services of the church. See, what can we do alone? <laughs> the answer is, not all that much. But what can we do if we all band together? You can give the answer. It's a whole lot more, isn't it? A whole lot more. Especially verse 25 says, it says, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, back then, the immediate application for the first audience was the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. That's when the Roman general Titus came down and he destroyed the temple, he destroyed the city, he killed off the priesthood and a big share of the population. And so for them, the place of their sacrifice would be gone and these people more than ever needed each other. But now, that's been 2,000 years ago. Now we're facing the end times. Quite frankly, they could be right around the corner. Things could get a whole lot worse before the rapture because we are told that things will wax worse and worse and worse until the end comes. Are you preparing for that? Are you watching for it? So you see, this passage tells us what we are supposed to do. We are invited to take advantage of our access to God through Christ and verse 22 told us to let us draw near with a true heart. God wants us to come to him. He wants us to dwell with him. He wants us to fellowship with him. And he invites us to come. And this should be the deepest cry and the deepest longing of our heart. Are you spending time with God? Won't you respond to God's invitation to come? And then we are encouraged to hold fast to our confession of faith. Well, shouldn't we do that? Shouldn't we cling tightly to it? God has given us his word. He's given us these promises, and we can trust them. And so verse 23 says, we are encouraged to let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And then we're to reach out and to touch other people's lives and encourage one another and to stir each other up to love and good works. Verse 22 says, we are told to let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. The question is, three of us, are you doing it? Are you responding to these three great invitations from God? 
Are you? Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you so much for this portion of Scripture. I love it when the Scriptures get practical. Theology is great for us to understand and to know. But Lord, when you tell us how to live by the stuff that we learn, it is so, so precious. And here we've seen these three great, these three great invitations for us to do. I just pray, Lord, that you have laid them upon our hearts and that we are eager to do it, to be in your presence, to cling tightly to the promises, never wavering, and to be here for one another, to stir up love and good works. We pray, Lord, that you will use us as your people in the lives of one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.